everyone, Dave here, and welcome back to Tolkien Adaptation Month, where right now I am preoccupied with the Tolkien animated... Trilogy? Dave's Obsession! Dave's Obsession of the Moment! Yes, long before Peter Jackson brought Middle Earth to the big screen, this was the movie trilogy we had to work with. A movie trilogy that was never supposed to be, and ultimately doesn't work as a trilogy, for reasons that aren't necessarily the fault of any individual entry, although they all have their peculiar issues too, but many Tolkien fans have a fondness for one, if not all of these cartoons, myself included. But their legacy is... complicated. Now, Tolkien never lived to see any of these films, and it's frankly impossible to gauge what he would have thought of them, but we know a little bit about what he might think of animated movies based on his work in general. Kind of. In his life, Tolkien seemed to be of multiple minds regarding potential filmed adaptations altogether, but especially animated adaptations. In general, he was open to a filmed adaptation, but he was not convinced it could actually work. As for animation specifically, in a 1957 letter, number 198 in the Letters of J.R.R. Tolkien collection, Tolkien wrote, I should welcome the idea of an animated motion picture with all the risk of vulgarization. So, at least at that time, he was open to the idea of a cartoon, but fully prepared for it to be a disappointment. But later in the early 70s, when John Borman was working on his never-produced version of the film, Borman claims Tolkien was relieved that it would be live-action, saying that he had a nightmare that it would be animated. Based on the other things I've heard about the Borman script, whether it was live-action or animated should have been the least of Tolkien's worries. But that's a different story. The thing is, at the time, it made a lot of sense for these to be animated. The Hobbit was seen as a children's fantasy adventure tale, the likes of which Disney built an empire out of, and Lord of the Rings was seen as practically unfilmable. For two distinct reasons. Reason number one, the scale. And reason number two, the scale. Uh, by that I mean reason number one, the scale of the story, the scope, the grand overwhelming world of Middle-earth, full of massive armies and cities rich with their own history. And reason number two, the physical scale of the different characters of Middle-earth. The diminutive hobbits and dwarves alongside the larger-than-life elves, wizards, and Dunedain. With animation, you don't have the limitations of live action. You can draw characters of any shape and size, and as many of them as you need, and put them in any exotic locale you can imagine. Let's put a pin in that thought. And for now, let's look at these movies individually, starting with Rankin Bass's The Hobbit. The greatest adventure is there if you're bold. Let go of the world that life makes you whole. Based on the original version of The Hobbit, did they forget the word book? The Hobbit might seem an odd choice of adaptation for the company that was mostly known for Christmas specials, especially when Tolkien himself wrote a separate Christmas mythology, but that had only just been published and it wasn't in the public domain. The Hobbit was, at the time, in the US only, due to a screw up from publishers. I have mixed feelings about that because as much as I support the public domain, I think it's unfair when an author's ownership over their work is taken from them because somebody else did something dumb. But the weird loophole that placed the books in the public domain was closed later, so the books are no longer in the public domain in the US, which I have even more complicated feelings about. Like, yeah, the circumstances that placed them in the public domain were unfair, but the precedent that things can be taken out of the public domain is really unsettling. Why yes, as a matter of fact, it is a constant struggle to reconcile my love of the public domain with my love of Disney stuff. Why do you ask? But complicated circumstances aside, the fact is, at the time, The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings were in the public domain in the US, but not internationally. So for an adaptation that the Tolkien estate didn't authorize, a big theatrical film that wouldn't be able to play overseas was probably not the best call. So instead, this was a made-for-TV special aired on NBC, but with plans to release it to theaters locally if the ratings were good enough. While the special definitely has a lot of the hallmarks of cheap television animation, with a $3 million budget, it was actually the most expensive television production in history at the time. Guess it's just really hard to do an affordable version of Middle-earth no matter what you do. The character designs are... something alright. 
They made a point of being true to any physical descriptions in the book, but that still gave them a lot of freedom to do this to Bilbo. You know, make him look like a cross between a Keebler elf and E.T. But hey, on some of the posters, his design is even worse. Gah, giant albino bullfrog! Maybe that's not Bilbo, maybe it's actually Smeagol, and that's why Gollum looks so amphibious. Still, no design in this special is uglier than the Wood Elves. Good God! I hope Legolas takes after his mom's side of the family. I guess they just really wanted to distinguish themselves from the elves they were already known for. Nobody's gonna mistake these guys for Hermie. But despite a few questionable character design choices, I really love the background arc, which is all like kinda realistic, but kinda stylized and completely beautiful. And it's no wonder considering the things the overseas animators responsible for this film would go on to do. As for some of the other stylistic choices, I keep going back and forth on that spiraling out thing characters do when they get killed. I can never decide if I love it or hate it. I don't know. What do you think? Let's talk. As for the writing, it's rushed. The characters mostly get reduced to the broadest archetypical versions of their characters from the book. Bilbo is fussy. Dwarves have a strange notion of perfection. Thorin is grumpy. A splendid lucky number you found for us. Bomber is fat. And uh, Bombo at your service. The rest of the dwarves are there too. Mr. Baggins. Bilbo. And Gandalf just seems mysterious for mysterious' sake in a way that's just unhelpful. Like, okay, much has been written about how the Gandalf of the Hobbit is more of a general mysterious old wizard trope than his more complex and grounded portrayal in Lord of the Rings, but reading The Hobbit, I still got the sense that he's, like, a character whose actions are motivated, even if the motivations are sometimes unclear to Bilbo and the dwarves. In this movie, not so much. If the secret door is hidden, how do we find it? The map doesn't tell. It does, and it doesn't. Huh? You will understand in time. Dude, if you don't know, you can just say that. And then when he's not being vague, it seems like he only cares about furthering Bilbo's development. Like he's making big moves for the sole purpose of Bilbo's self-actualization. Like he's some sort of manic wizard dream Gandalf. Now, now, I am already late because of bothering with you people. I am sending Mr. Baggins with you. That should be enough. The burglar? Me? I'm no equal to a wizard. Nonsense. You are the lucky number. And soon you'll find out there's more about you than you guess. You don't really suppose, do you, that all your adventures and escapes were managed by mere luck? Just for your sole benefit? No, he believes that you orchestrated everything just for his sole benefit. You made choices just because they would drive his arc, not because you have anything else going on in Middle-earth. Also, Gandalf seems to know the whole time that Bilbo has a magic ring. Your story, Bilbo, has the ring of truth. Yes, it rings true. Okay, fair. In the book, Bilbo did wonder if Gandalf guessed the part he let out, and I think that's a fun way of adapting that note. But Gandalf seems to know already that it's the one ring? Oh, Bilbo Baggins. If you really understood that ring, uh, someday members of your family not yet born will. Then you'd realize that this story has not ended, but is only beginning. You are uncharacteristically chill about that. I guess having the most evil item in the universe resurface is just, you know, cute and quirky as long as it can teach Bilbo another lesson. So with the writing so rushed, most of the characterization is left to the voice actors, and to the movie's credit, there is a murderer's row of comedians and voice talent from the era. If you can accept the fact that the denizens of Middle-earth have American accents. Orson Bean is solid as Bilbo. His fussiness comes across beautifully. Eggs and bacon, a good full pipe, my garden at twilight, cakes. When he's not being bogged down with wildly stilted dialogue. I'm a quiver with anticipation. And while it's kind of hard to accept anyone other than Andy Serkis in the role anymore, I think Brother Theodore is a pretty good golem. Yes, my precious. It's a juicy, gooey, yucky, 
Is it scrumptious? And Hans Conried as Thor in Oakenshield is inspired. Who better to capture a cartoonified version of the Dwarf King's indignance and greed than Captain Hook? Curses to the dragon. Curses to Smog. He killed our men and stole our gold. And another Captain Hook, Cyril Richard, plays Elrond. Sadly, he passed away only a few weeks after this production aired, so this was his final role, but while it's brief, he plays it well. Yes, of course. Well, first of all, they're not troll make. They must have been stolen. Paul Freeze does a few additional voices, and Thurl Ravenscroft does some singing, and Dave does Disney fans know how I feel about that wonderful combination. As for Gandalf, you're always going to need someone with real gravitas. But this is just a made-for-TV cartoon, so I'm afraid that all we can get is John Huston! And so, tomorrow begins your greatest adventure. Yay! Yeah! Hollywood legend John Huston, the guy whose directorial debut was the Maltese freaking Falcon, the guy who played the evil creep in that movie directed by the other evil creep. And amazingly, this was not his only influence on a Tolkien adaptation, although the others were long after his death. He had a little bit of an influence on the Jackson movies. Look at some John Huston. His tree beard without the fungus looks like John Huston a bit. And one of my favorite Lord of the Rings parodies draws heavily from his work. What is it, Gandalf? It's the ring, Frodo. It must be taken and thrown into the fire in Mount Doom. Hmm. All right. Of course, some characters are cut altogether, notably Bayorn, and there are simplifications throughout the story, some of them really minor, like dropping the Durin's Day concept from the secret door, and some much bigger, like removing the Arkenstone. Okay, I fully understand why the Arkenstone thread seemed expendable in the name of condensing the story, but I do feel like it was one of the fatal errors here. Without that element, Bilbo and Thorin's argument at the end doesn't seem like a major betrayal on Bilbo's part causing the friendship to rupture permanently. It just seems like more of the same squabbling they've been doing the whole time. Wear it proudly, and it will carry you to victory. Confusticate and be bother victory. My only hope is to be taken prisoner as quickly as possible. Those are the words of a coward. The coward who always went forward while you cringed behind? You don't see us cringing now, do you? And when it just seems like more of the same, the deathbed reconciliation is far less meaningful. Farewell, good thief. I wish to part in friendship. And then there are other scenes that I have to assume were written, but were deleted after the fact. Run to the Wood Elves clearing. Never mind the fact that the audience never once saw us discover the Wood Elves clearing, we just know about it. But what really makes me sad about the condensed writing is how much of the humor of the book really suffers. As Bilbo and Gandalf's good morning conversation is cut, as is the comic build of the dwarves slowly arriving and overwhelming poor Bilbo. Instead they go for... mysterious and spooky. Enough. I am Gandalf, and Gandalf means me. Gandalf? Not the wandering wizard. We must away at break of day. Mysterious and spooky isn't a terrible choice of tone overall, but man do I miss the book's humor. In one case, they not only cut out the funny part of the book, but in doing so, they fundamentally change what Gandalf's powers are. Rather than tricking the trolls into arguing with each other until sunrise, Gandalf just makes the sun come up. Dawn, take you all, and be stoned. Man, that's a hell of a power. I knew you were the wielder of the flame of Anor, but I didn't know you could control Anor. Did... Did this happen because the screenwriter misunderstood the line, the dawn comes early? How did the morning come so soon? That's not to say the movie is without its own sense of humor. The movie's sense of humor seems to mostly involve Bilbo whining, which is hit or miss. Thank you, but I'd appreciate a more pragmatic salute. In other words, extinguish me! And Thorin using burgle as a verb, which gets old a little faster. Burglar, do your burgling. Well, you are the burglar. Go down and burgle something. What did you burgle? Burglar, madam. That said, the ceasefire between the three armies as the goblins arrive is 
well, it's hilarious. I'm assuming that it's trying to be a comedy beat. Take their heads! Kill, Kill the man! man. Kill, Kill the elves! Oh, great elf king, my truest friend and ally, we must join our forces against this common scourge. But of course, O oh noble king under the mountain, your people are like brothers unto mine. Together! Thorin is correct. I simply do not understand war. A side effect of some of the rushing is giving Bilbo more agency in minor ways, such as having him directly tell the Thrush to deliver the message to Bard, rather than the Thrush just overhearing it and deciding to give the message to Bard. You have seen Smog. You know his vulnerable spot. Go now to Lake Town. There is a guardsman, Bard. Tell him. Never mind how I know that you can talk to Bard. Just go about it. And earlier than that, Bilbo actively chooses to ask Gollum what he has in his pocket, rather than accidentally asking it, which really sucks. Like, Bilbo accidentally stumbling into asking a non-riddle, and that being what ends up saving him, that is funny stuff, and it's true to his character. But Bilbo deliberately asking a non-riddle in a riddles game? What have I got in my pocket? Not here! Not here! To us, my precious, but it's got in its nasty little pocket this. I'm sorry, that's my riddle. And if you can't guess it, you lose. That sucks! You're a no-good cheater, Baggins! They also remove the moment where Bilbo almost kills Gollum after that. They just have Bilbo run away without trying to kill him. Ta-ta! I presume they changed that to keep the story kid-friendly, but... I feel like we lose a lot there. The pity that stays Bilbo's hand is one of the most pivotal moments in the history of Middle-earth. The fact that Bilbo chose Mercy may not make much of a difference in this story specifically, but it changes everything that follows, and it's hard to feel like an authentic Middle-earth adaptation without that moment. Also, this is definitely the revised version of Riddles in the Dark, so the opening credits really had no business saying based on the original version. Peggy's. Look, I know, changing things is just a natural element of adaptation. And trimming things for time? I may not agree with every change, but I at least understand why they do it. And then there are some changes here that I can't even necessarily say they're bad. I just don't know why they made these changes. Well, first of all, they're not troll make. Why does Elrond have a beard? Even half-elves aren't exactly known for their beards. There are moon letters here. Those aren't the moon letters. Those are the runes that say five feet high the door and three may walk abreast. The script knew this because Bilbo referenced them earlier despite them not being visible. This hand points from these uh, runes. Yep, I see these runes, these very runes. Look at them. That ring is way more ornate than the ring as described in the book. It's got, like, designs and stuff on it. There are moments which can change a person for all time. And I suddenly wondered if I would ever see my snug hobbit hole again. I wondered if I actually wanted to. That is not the attitude Bilbo had climbing the tree in the book. No. You left the cells unlocked when you freed the dwarves from the Wood Elves' dungeon? You didn't lock the doors and return the keys so they would think the dwarves have a very strong magic to pass through all those locked doors and disappear? I mean, I guess I get it as visual shorthand for they're all free now, but, huh. Sorry you could not find me, but a fine burglar takes expert catching. <laughs> burglar? Why did you show yourself to Smaug? Even in all your growth and newfound bravery, would you really be that cocky? A battle of four armies. One, two, three, yes, four. No, no, it's already five armies. The book counts the wargs as a second army separate from the goblins. The eagles! Five armies now? Actually, no, the eagles do not count as an army. I don't make the rules, take it up with Johnny Ronnie. What happened? We won.
Bomber gone, too. Bomber died? He didn't die in the book. He lived on so that Tolkien could take some time out of Lord of the Rings, Book 2, Chapter 1, many meetings to further fat shame him. Bomber was now so fat that he could not move himself from his couch to his chair at table, and it took six young dwarves to lift him. I'm not saying I want to keep the fat shaming, I'm just saying, why did you kill Bomber? Of our original 13, how many are left? Seven. Only Feely and Keely died in the battle! Wait, did you get that seven number from the aforementioned many meetings, where Glowin says that only seven of the original company remain? Because again, he specifically mentions Bomber as one of the remaining seven. Dwalin, Glowin, Dory, Nori, Beefer, Boffer, and Bomber! And Thorin? Soon there will be only six. Your seven living included Thorin? You're killing more dwarves in one battle than Tolkien killed over 77 years? Man, Rankin Bass Productions just has some real dwarf bloodlust. I guess I shouldn't be surprised that they're Team Elf after all. So after discussing what this production removes and changes from the book, what does it add to the book? Well, mostly songs. Or that is mostly music for the songs that are already in the book. There is one brand new song, the theme song The Greatest Adventure, sung by Glenn Yarborough, and yeah, I have a fondness for this, even if I think the sentiment is kinda simplistic, even for this story, but it has a charm that I can't deny. The greatest adventure was born by The rest of the songs have lyrics adapted by Jules Bass from Tolkien's original poetry, with music by Maury Laws. Most of the lyrical adaptation comes in the form of abridgment, although for In the Valley they straight up changed the stanza structure. The line, and Balin and Dwalin down into the valley in June, haha, -ha, gets changed to And Balin and Dwalin in June My dear Elrond, your hospitality is magnificent. Now I know what you're thinking right now, but 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 what does that mean for the later stanza they were setting up a rhyme for? And listen and hark till the end of the dark to our tune, ha ha. Oh, they just cut that stanza. So, you know, solutions. Moving on from elves singing, uh, I have to note that Tolkien describes the goblins singing as croaking and that their songs sound truly terrifying and horrible. He paints the picture of a very unpleasant experience listening to the goblins sing about whipping and cracking. So naturally, the good people at Rankin Bass Productions decided to turn the goblin songs into absolute freaking jams! <laughs> In a fiery breeze. These are the catchiest songs in the whole thing. They are awesome, they rock, they are completely tonally inappropriate for their places in the story, but I love them. Ask him to explain his weapon. This sword is named Orchrist, the Goblin Cleaver. <laughs> Murderers! Elf friends! I do love how the goblins have squeaky speaking voices, but beautiful, rich, deep singing voices. Thurl paved the way for the latter-day career of Robert Goulet. The soundtrack album also includes a song that didn't make it into the film, Bilbo's Taunting of the Mirkwood Spiders. Hey, Adderkop, hey, Adderkop, you can't catch anybody. I'd be curious to see how this would have been integrated into the animation, assuming that that was ever the plan. Thing is, I've never been able to find a whole lot of behind-the-scenes info on the movie, which made it all the more fascinating to me when at a used bookstore, my family found this. A 1989 illustrated version of The Hobbit using illustrations from the Rankin-Bass film. Appropriately enough, a literal Red Book of Westmarch. Although I'm sure it originally had a slipcover. But this is the unabridged text of the original book, featuring not only screenshots from the cartoon, but also concept art. So you get some slightly different character designs and some different colors, a shockingly high number of drawings of a green version of Smaug, and at one point in development apparently the ring had a diamond on it, which would have been just plain sacrilegious. But there are also illustrations of some scenes that didn't make it into the movie. 
there's exactly one drawing of Bayorn in human form, one drawing in bear form, and a drawing of the gruesome fate of his victims. There's an illustration of the Arkenstone, and of Bilbo's meeting with Bard and Thranduil to hand it over. So were all these scenes animated and deleted? Or did they just make it to the concept art stage? Or were they never going to be in the movie and these were just drawn in the movie style for this book? I have no idea. But it's an interesting peek at what a more complete take on the story from this team might look like. I have a lot of fondness for this movie, but I don't think it does justice to the book. If The Hobbit was just another children's book, and this was just one of many adaptations of it, this would be fine. It's like, I don't know, Chuck Jones' version of The Cricket in Times Square. A cute cartoon based on a book you kinda remember reading as a kid. Unless your favorite book actually is Cricket in Times Square, in which case I apologize. Point is, I feel like if The Hobbit was just a standalone book, if this had been released before Lord of the Rings was written, this would feel a lot more serviceable than I find it right now. But the only real authorized theatrical feature film to come from Tolkien's work until Jackson came along is Ralph Bakshi's Lord of the Rings. Now, this movie has been examined all over the internet many times over. Decades ago, the Tolkien Sarcasm page posted a particularly snarky, nitpicky recap that is harsher on the film than I would be, but it does still make me laugh. And more recently, Dan Olson did a more charitable look at the film with a more thorough look at the context of the production. So, yeah. Tolkien fans are divided on this movie. Even among the cast and crew of the live-action movies, opinions towards this movie differ. My first introduction to The Lord of the Rings was when I saw the Ralph Bakshi cartoon film in 1978. There is one shot which I regard as my homage to the cartoon, because it did inspire me to want to read the book. Have you talked about the Bakshi version, the Ralph Bakshi version of uh, Lord bit. of the Rings from the 1970s? Yeah, here and there. But it was mostly terrible. Mm. It was mostly really, really, really awful. So, since this movie has been thoroughly examined from seemingly every angle, all I can do is express my personal feelings about this movie. Did I grow up loving it, just grateful to have any adaptation of Fellowship? Or did I grow up hating it and waiting desperately for something better to come along? The answer is... neither. I didn't see this movie as a kid. I really wanted to, but I could never track a copy down for myself. Like, it was available, it was around, it wasn't out of print or anything. But back then, if your local blockbuster didn't have a movie in stock, it was not so easy to get your hands on. I really wanted to see this as a kid. I saw both the Rankin-Bass movies and I wanted the trilogy to be complete. But the most I saw of this as a kid was the clips used as the opening cutscene of Interplay's Lord of the Rings computer game. I was intrigued to see more, although I was confused as to why the art style looks so different from the other movies in the trilogy. I had no idea. But eventually, long after the Jackson movies came out, my local blockbuster finally obtained a copy of Bakshi's Lord of the Rings. So I finally got to see it, and I've seen it many times since then. And my feelings about this movie? I love that it exists. I don't know if I love watching the movie itself. There are certainly parts I love about it, and I really admire its ambition, but I have a lot of respect for this movie. And I think I love it as an oddity, as a peculiar piece of Tolkien history and animation history. I think for the most part, its heart is in the right place. But I also think a lot about this film is misguided. The thing that drew Bakshi to Lord of the Rings was the realism it had for a fantasy story. I mean, it was probably the greatest fantasy for realism. Here's a, Tolkien is so brilliant, so great. Um, Here's a totally believable world he put together. You know, every page, detail on what they're eating and how they look and how they feel. I've never read anything like it in my whole life to this date. So he wanted to honor that realism by making the most realistic looking animation he could manage. Hence this movie's extensive use of rotoscoping. And you produce photographs from the live action frame by frame. If you put these photographs on an animator's desk and have them draw over the photographs, you now have a pencil drawing of the drawn photograph. And remember how I said that the advantage to doing Lord of the Rings as an animated movie is solving the problem of scale and scale? Unfortunately, the rotoscoped animation sticks a little too close to the live action source footage, so the result is a movie with uncommonly small armies, an uncommonly tall dwarf, and an uncommonly short Balrog. 
There are other interesting visual stylistic choices, particularly in the backgrounds in some sequences, which I don't think is necessarily a bad choice. It helps convey the fears the characters are feeling, but I think it's odd that Bakshi talked a big game about being so concerned with the realism of the story and then went and added so many deliberately unrealistic visuals. One minute Middle Earth is being brought to life in beautiful detail, the next minute we're in an endless void of vague color. And sometimes they don't go with rotoscoping so much as solarization, and I don't want to diminish how much work things took back then, but by 1998, a camcorder you got at Costco could do this effect with the push of a button. And no matter how much work you put into it, you can never hide the fact that this is clearly mostly live-action footage in the middle of your animated movie, and the other characters are clearly drawn and just Roger Rabbited in. Or, since this is Bakshi, I guess Cool Worlded in. The effect can be off-putting, but there is one place where I think this effect actually works really well for the story, and that is the Prancing Pony. It allows them to include the party atmosphere of the Brie of the book, while still making the hobbits look just as out of place and unwelcome as they feel in the Jackson version. This is the place where I think the stylistic choice works best in service of the story and the tone. The rotoscoping has some interesting results, but ultimately this project is an ambitious filmmaker using experimental techniques for a Tolkien adaptation that doesn't necessarily benefit from those techniques. Fortunately, that would never happen again. For his part, Bakshi later expressed regret at how close the rotoscoping stayed to the source footage. Still, Bakshi was ahead of his time with the use of rotoscoping. Using live-action reference to guide the animation? That's like the biggest thing Jackson's Two Towers was praised for. Unfortunately, this production was also ahead of its time in creating a crunch culture. We were working seven days a week, 12 hours a day. We'd literally leave at eight at night when it was getting dark and say, okay, I'll see you at sunrise. And you'd come back the next day and you'd work and you'd work and you'd drink coffee. And a lot of people drawing, throwing things away. Drawing not good, throwing things away. Hobbit hair. I got, I got fired once for because somebody did a lousy job on Hobbit hair. You know, the production of the Jackson movies was definitely arduous, but the DVD features at least create the impression that everyone was happy to be there, even if times got hard. The DVD for the animated version of Lord of the Rings makes the entire experience of working on the film sound absolutely miserable. And nobody seemed more miserable about it than Bakshi himself. You know, the amount of work to produce rings, the frames, the people, shooting live action and animation. I mean, I don't think anyone ever appreciated I was on the verge of insanity. But there was so much real talent on this film. So much of Bakshi's reputation was built on his movies being adult cartoons, not like Disney cartoons. So it's kind of hilarious that the rotoscope reference for Frodo was an original Mouseketeer, and the rotoscope reference for Sam and Bilbo would go on to be the original Figment. As for the voice cast, it's all great British theater actors. The most famous is John Hurt as Aragorn. Here is the sword of Elendil of Gondor, who fought the Dark Lord long ago and was slain. The most surprising is Anthony Daniels in a rare non-3PO role as Legolas. What a people you dwarves are for hiding things. On the gates of your most wondrous ancient kingdom, you write, speak, friend, and enter. And no spell in any language can open the door. And on a sad note, Elrond is played by Andre Morel, who passed away just a few weeks after this was released. Is animated Elrond just a cursed role? As an adaptation, it's mostly a straightforward adaptation. Obviously, things get shuffled around and condensed, as they do in all adaptations. Very few things are created out of whole cloth for this one, but as is usually the case in Tolkien adaptations, characters get conflated. Ah! Legolas! Okay... Glorfindale? Ugh. Everything all right? Oh, he's been pissed about this longer than the rest of us. He's still mad about the cartoon. Look, I'm not upset about getting replaced by Arwen in the movies. I get it! She's great! <laughs> she's the freaking even star, and she's the big romantic lead, so let's increase her role, fine. <laughs> Arwen's great. Yeah, yeah, everyone loves our little sister. No oh, hush. But the stupid cartoon replaces me with Legolas, a freaking wood elf. Do you think that all elven subcultures are just interchangeable, Bakshi? You can't just go and replace a Noldor with a Sindar willy-nilly. The only reason he was in Rivendale was to apologize because he lost Gollum. But sure, give him my role. 
I died in the first age and was resurrected. But sure, let the trust fund kid from Mirkwood take over. God, just give all my glory to the guy who already happens to be in the story. Hey, at least you weren't replaced by the same guy twice. I will find Aomer and his riders. At one point, Bakshi wanted to do a full trilogy, but he couldn't figure out how to make the second film work. Little did he know that the way to make the second film work is apparently just to completely screw up Faramir and Treebeard. For a while, there was also interest in Bakshi doing The Hobbit as well, which may have been stopped directly because of the Rankin-Bass Hobbit, leading Bakshi to publicly mock Rankin-Bass Productions, claiming that his Tolkien movie is not going to have any song for the sake of a record album. But, like... You know there are songs in Lord of the Rings, right? It's not just to sell soundtracks, it's actually part of the book. You do know this because you did include one of the songs in your movie, even if you didn't include it on the soundtrack album. There is an inn, a merry old inn, beneath an old grey hill. Ultimately, it was decided that there would be two films, and then there was only one. This is not the fault of the adapters, but it does kind of make the film suffer as setups are introduced without payoff, leaving it impossible to really judge their effectiveness as setups. Many people have talked about how annoying this take on Samwise is, and I really wish we could have seen him actually come into his own at the end of the story to see if this particularly squealy Sam was an effective setup for his arc. Alas, we'll never know. Also, there are plenty of things to nitpick about the adaptation, like the fact that as much as Bakshi bragged about staying true to the book, he'd occasionally subvert a detail. Nothing that, like, fundamentally changed the functions of the story, like some of the Rankin-Bass changes, just little things like how the text deliberately notes that the doors of Durin swing outward. <laughs> That is such a small nitpick, it is not important to the story or anything, it's just another of those things where I can't imagine why it was change. Especially since the change makes the watcher in the water shutting them in look a little clunkier than it would if he was slamming the door in on them from the outside. More prominently, there are some... interesting pronunciations in this. I'm not really in a position to judge because I'm sure I've been saying so many character names wrong, but then again, I'm just one dork and not a guy with a production team who can take the time to memorize the pronunciation guys in the appendices. One odd pronunciation choice is pretty infamous, the fact that it was decided to change Saruman's name to Aramon to make it less confusing with Sauron, but that decision is only used in half of the final film. I have come for your aid, Saruman the White. That would take the ring too close to Isengard and Aruman. And there are other odd or just plain incorrect pronunciations that pop up here and there. And this is my Lord Celeborn. You come with me to Adoras, my friends? If Saruman strikes now, he will overrun Adoras in a single night. I know the language of Middle-earth is important because, well, the languages are the reason there is a Middle-earth, but in the grand scheme of storytelling, the pronunciations are nitpicks. The biggest problem with this movie is it's incomplete. And we'll never know if the completion would have been satisfying because part two never happened. There's a lot of hearsay about why part two never happened, but one of the rumors is that Bakshi walked away specifically because he was mad that they dropped part one from the title and tricked audiences into seeing an incomplete film. The studios were concerned nobody would pay money to see a part one because they'd think it's just half a movie. This was a simpler time in Hollywood. If that is the reason Bakshi walked away, it might be counterintuitive that your revenge for the studio tricking your audience into not knowing the film was incomplete is to never complete the film. I don't know. I don't think the problems with this film, either on screen or behind the scenes, can be blamed on any one person. I don't think this is fully a case of Bakshi ruining the text, nor do I think it's fully a case of those meddling studio heads ruining his vision that would have been perfect if they just gave him free range. I think Bakshi genuinely wanted to do right by Tolkien, and I think he did in a lot of aspects and then misplaced ambitions sometimes got in the way. I think all of the cast and crew tried their hardest to make the best Lord of the Rings film they could within their limitations, and a confused studio made those limitations even harder than they needed to be. I think ultimately, this just turned out to be a more difficult task than expected. But if nothing else, this movie proved that Lord of the Rings wasn't entirely unfilmable, as it had so long been believed. So I will always be grateful to it for that, if nothing else. Without this, we wouldn't have the Jackson trilogy, we wouldn't have any of Lord of the Rings' current resurgence in pop culture, 
this movie saved Lord of the Rings, you could say, or at the very least made it possible for it to become mainstream. Bakshi is retired from animation, and he has often said that even if he goes back into it, he's done with adapting other people's work. But as recently as 2018, he said that if the studio wants to conclude his version of Lord of the Rings, he'd be happy to consult. And you know what? I say go for it. Just do it, Warner Brothers. If you can have 18 concurrent unrelated Batman movie franchises, you can have three versions of Return of the King. Hashtag release the Bakshi cut. And speaking of Return of the King, let's talk about Rankin Bass's Return of the King. You won't have to say goodbye. Oh, now they remember the ring is supposed to look plain. The other movies in this trilogy have their fans, but generally, this is the black sheep of the animated Tolkien adaptations. Even the filmmakers weren't particularly happy with how it turned out. Put all that material into, into, a, into a film is very, very difficult. And we found that, not with The Hobbit. The Hobbit worked, because uh, it's a simpler story. But The Return of the King, we had to summarize what had happened before and, uh, and put it all together in, in two hours. It's not a very good film. The fact that it even exists is baffling enough. It's a common misconception that Rankin Bass stepped in to finish the trilogy when it became clear Bakshi's sequel wouldn't happen, tying up the loose ends just so there would be a conclusion. And even ignoring the difference in character designs and voices, it doesn't really tie up those loose ends. Not only does Treebeard completely disappear, but Gimli and Legolas too, although given how they drew Legolas' dad, that's probably just as well. Saruman and Wormtongue also disappear, although that's just a trend in non-extended editions. We never see Merry and Pippin reunite with Gandalf, nor do we see Aragorn leave Gandalf. He's just returning from somewhere. Also, Frodo just has the file of Galadriel. We never see him get it in the Bakshi movie. And apparently its magic only works by keeping the star a secret. The file of Galadriel. I can say no more. But if I betray the trust and give the secret, its powers will die. Okay. And then some characters just never show up in either movie. There's no Shelob, for instance. We just have to assume that the trap Gollum was leading Frodo and Sam to was just these orcs. She might help us. And there's no Faramir unless this dude next to Eowyn at the end is Faramir. Or maybe it's Eomer? Or maybe Urkenbrand, Baragond, Imrahil? There's no way of knowing. So if this was made to tie up Bakshi's Lord of the Rings, it does not succeed in that mission. But here's the thing. It wasn't made to tie up Bakshi's Lord of the Rings. The phrase Lord of the Rings isn't even used in the title, or even in that weird based on the original version credit. But the one with the hills and bears. The truth is... Rankin Bass's plan was always to just make two movies, The Hobbit and The Hobbit 2, The Return of the King, or The Hobbit 2, Frodo, as was also considered as a title. They began working on their Return of the King before their Hobbit was even released. I can't believe that by never seeing the Bakshi movie as a kid, I was watching these as Rankin Bass intended. Why did you, uh, just out of curiosity, go straight to The Return of the King instead of parts one and two? of that trilogy, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I didn't know that we could handle it. I didn't, I didn't know the audience would sit still for it. I was wrong. So you thought that just telling one story and then the very end of a kind of related story was the solution? I'm going to apologize to Beauty and the Beast live on stage. I take back everything I said about a series of strange circumstances. So this isn't a conclusion to an epic trilogy. It's just a sequel to The Hobbit. The result is a Tolkien adaptation that has less in common with its own source material than it does with the earlier adaptation of a related but very different piece of source material. Fortunately, that would never happen again! Sure, the movie doesn't make a whole lot of sense as a conclusion to a trilogy it never meant to conclude, but it makes even less sense as the standalone sequel to The Hobbit it actually was meant to be. We just start with this shot of Mount Doom, which is totally different from the Lonely Mountain, and Gandalf tells you that a story's happening. Hear you now, a story of good against evil. Then it's Bilbo's birthday in Rivendell, and we're going to tell Bilbo the story, but not the whole story, just the part that starts with Return of the King. But why destroy a thing of such wondrous magic? 
It was an evil thing, sir. Just trust us, the ring was evil. We don't need any more details about what was evil about it. And never you mind that Gandalf was cavalier about its true nature earlier. And now we're in Mordor, a lot happened off screen. Just catch up yourselves. Everyone talks a lot about how King Aragorn is going to return and it makes him come off like a mysteriously missing king of old. Someone who disappeared ages ago and generations have been awaiting his return in a Christ-like fashion. Which I guess is kind of accurate but it does not get across the fact that he was just hanging out with Frodo not long ago. Also, they leave in Gollum calling Frodo master, but they do not leave in any of the setup for that relationship. Wicked master. Odd, odd choices all around. Being a sequel to The Hobbit, this naturally focuses on The Hobbits. Like, look at this cover for one of the later VHS releases of the movie. It makes it look like Frodo is the titular king. Also, it makes it look like dwarves are in this movie. There are no dwarves in this movie. Not even in the flashbacks to The Hobbit. In fact, despite the fact that I saw this movie many times as a kid, before revisiting it for the series, I could not remember if Aragorn is even in this. The titular king made very little impact in Return of the King. In a distant land, the noble Aragorn, heir to the empty throne of Gondor, awaited with a small band to return and become king. But he could not triumph until the ring was destroyed. Oh, okay, there he is. That's why I couldn't remember. I was getting him mixed up with Hanna-Barbera's version of King Saul. Wrong greatest adventure. Houston and Theodore return as Gandalf and Gollum, as well as Orson Bean as not only Bilbo, but also Frodo. Paul Free steps in for Elrond, and he didn't die until six years later, so I think he broke the animated Elrond curse. The apparently forgettable titular King Aragorn is played by Theodore Bikel, making his scenes with Gandalf kind of an African queen reunion? Nellie Bellflower plays Eowyn, the first female Tolkien character Rankin Bass animated. Seriously, even all the extras in Lake Town were male, what's with that? Oh, wait, no, I'm wrong. She's the second female character, if you count Rosie Cotton, in this fantasy sequence Sam has about settling down earlier in the movie. Fourth, if you count the daughters in that same fantasy sequence. Speaking of Samwise, he's Roddy McDowell, and if you liked him talking to himself on the phone in the cat from outer space, you'll love him talking to himself walking through Mordor. Fighting among themselves? Oh, I could get in. They wouldn't notice me. The ring holds me back. Once the orcs saw me, they'd forget their own arguments for the head of an enemy. God help us! Um, I believe you mean Eru Iluvatar help us? At least I think so. I haven't read The Silmarillion, but that's what I'm told. Pippin is Sonny Melendez, and Mary is Casey Kasem. And with all due respect to Dominic Monaghan, I think that means that legally, live-action Mary should have been Matthew Lillard. And other animation mainstays joined the cast, including Don Messick, speaking of Scooby-Doo, as both Theoden and the Mouth of Sauron. And the Rocky and Bullwinkle narrator himself, William Conrad, plays a take on Denethor that makes me want to apologize to the live-action movie. I take back everything I said about that Denethor losing his dignity. They soon all shall be burned. The West has failed. It shall go up in a great fire, and all shall be ended. I have looked inside my Palantir. What is that? Palantir, the stuff of wizards. You would know that if anyone had animated Book 3, Chapter 11. And once again, the pronunciations are ah oh, ha ha all over the place. Like, Bakshi at least made an effort with authenticity, it's just that some pronunciations slipped through the cracks in the chaos of production. But with this movie, these are the people who mixed up the runes on Thror's map. I'm pretty sure they didn't even know there were pronunciation guides in the appendices. Ah, uh, you know the gates to the land of Mordor and your Dark Lord Sauron, Sirithungal. Minus Tirith. Gora Gorath. And yes, this thing is full of little changes that I have to imagine were in the service of making it more kid-friendly, not too scary. Merry and Pippin reunite happily during battle. Merry has no need for the Houses of Healing. Hail, proud Merry! Keep on going! When Aragorn shows up, the armies of Mordor just run away. Aragorn, he who would be our king, had returned. 
and the hosts of Mordor were seized with bewilderment, and they fled. Ah, crap! Aragorn's here! What's the use of trying? And oddest of all, they keep Theoden's death, but they cut the Nazgul attacking him. Instead, how does he die? The new morning was blotted from the sky, and the dark fell upon him. No, Snowman! No! And the dark force had claimed our safe. And what event? At just that moment caused evil to enlist such power. Nothing here, surely, but in the bowels of Mount Doom. I have come, but I do not choose to do now what I have come to do. Frodo fucking killed Theoden. And then, of course, Eowyn does her thing. No living man may hinder me. But no living man am I. You look upon a woman. Eowyn am I. Wait, there are women in this universe? This scene would have been really effective if we had ever met Eowyn before this, or seen the relationship between her and Theoden. As it stands, Mary has to fill us in on why this matters, and that just makes it awkward. A woman? Eowyn? Tis... Tis Lord Theoden's niece. She wanted to ride with us, but he forbade. <laughs> she disguised as a knight and she came hither. Uncle, I have avenged thee. By killing the guy who did not kill you in this version. But as with all of these, there are things I like about this adaptation. I really appreciate that they were smart enough to make Sam the focus. They even give him the pity for Gollum that they neglected to give Bilbo. How can I kill such a pitiful and cringing abomination? I have come to know the strain of bearing the ring for even a little while. But this miserable creature enslaved to it for years. Oh, curse you, you stinking thing. Be off, I don't trust you. Not as far as I could kick you, but be off. Sam is the POV character more often than not, and I feel like an even lesser production would have just shoved him into the sidekick role. It's not quite the bumbling batshy Sam coming into his own, but it is a Sam who has already come into his own and is determined to get the job done. I especially love that they included Sam's temptation by the ring. I could claim you, ring. I would be Samwise the Strong. It's such a brief moment in the book that it's easy to forget. And I don't mind when adaptations just eliminate the risk of Sam being corrupted, but I love when it's included. I love that Sam both is tempted and is able to resist the temptation. And I love how wholesome his dark evil fantasy is. This orc infested desert of nameless horrors, let it live for Samwise the Strong! Behold, the gardens of my delight! Gardens, gardens everywhere! <laughs> Incessant talking to himself aside, Roddy McDowell does such a good job as determined warrior Sam that I really wish we got to hear him do the beginning of the arc too. Hear him as nervous, scared gardener Sam. I just want one complete Samwise arc in a cartoon. Is that too much to ask? And of course, being a sequel to The Hobbit, there are songs. Problem is, there's less poetry in Return of the King than there is in The Hobbit or even Fellowship. So most of these songs are kind of made up out of whole cloth. Although some are sort of inspired by lines of dialogue from the text. And with a few exceptions, these songs are largely forgettable. But they gave them an in-universe singer this time. And yes, he's Glenn Yarborough. We have brought with us someone who has written a ballad about the adventures of Frodo. The Minstrel of Gondor. <laughs> Frodo of the Nine Fingers and the Ring of Doom. Now, the lyrics of this song don't come from the book, but the existence of it does. Book 6, Chapter 4, there's a minstrel of Gondor singing about Frodo of the Nine Fingers and the Ring of Doom. 
And yet, both Tolkien Gateway and One Wiki to Rule Them All claim this character only exists in the film. I know about a character from the book that the two most prominent Tolkien wikis don't. I should not be so smug about this because I'm sure I've been getting so many other details wrong. Anyway, in the book, the Minstrel of Gondor is in Gondor, which makes sense, but I guess he came all this way to Rivendell just to tell Bilbo the story because, well, what else is he gonna do? So he sings a song that's one of the few in this that I kinda like, even if the lyrics need work. When Bilbo found that shiny ring in Gollum's cave of gloom, he never thought that it would turn into a ring of doom. Well, in his defense, if a ring of doom had been a concept that was even on his radar, the possibility might have crossed his mind that the one in the cave of gloom would become one. Frodo of the nine fingers and the ring of doom. It started with a hobbit in Gollum's cave of gloom. Boy, you were really proud of that rhyme, huh, Jules? As for the rest of the songs, well, there's the song that reprises whenever someone succumbs to the ring's temptation or is on the verge of doing so. The bearer of the ring, the wearer of the ring, stands on the very brink of fate. The bearer of the ring, the wearer of the ring, the bearer of the ring, the wearer of snarer of the ring, the sharer of the ring, the scarer of the ring, Tom Lehrer of the ring. There's less can be more during Sam's settling down fantasy, which musically is like an okay folk music b-side, but the lyrics are at least attempting to engage with Tolkien's themes of the value of simplicity. Less can be more, and small can be beautiful, I don't want it all just part of wonderful before. or maybe it's just the production team trying to justify the simpler tv cartoon rather than a more complete adaptation there's leave tomorrow till it comes a song that seems counterintuitive at this urgent hour in the story leave tomorrow till it comes sleep will ease your mind but it pairs with this wild dream sequence so Frodo has some dreams in Fellowship that are usually left out of adaptations. Return of the King mentions uneasy dreaming, but it doesn't really give specifics. So this is pretty much made up out of whole cloth. Frodo dreams of a happier version of the quest where Mordor is lush, orcs are friendly, destroying the ring is simple, but apparently still necessary even though there's no evil. And then Gandalf and Sam turn into orcs, which are no longer friendly. It's a wild moment, but it is a pretty accurate representation of anxiety dreams. There's The Towers of the Teeth, a taunting song the forces of Mordor seem to be singing at Aragorn's men as they march toward the Black Gate. If you win, then you will lose. Choice of evils yours to choose. Retreat. 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 Heads I win and tails you lose. Why do hobbits wear no shoes on feet? Retreat, retreat, retreat. There's the victory song in the denouement, which isn't all that memorable, but I do like that it includes a reference to the Houses of Healing. The end of the ring, the return of the king, he shall rule with a true healing hand. Throughout the piece, there's the reprise of The Road Goes Ever, Ever On, which includes a verse about not trying? It's so easy not to try Let the world go drifting by If you never say hello You won't have to say goodbye I am not sure if it's in favor of giving up or if it's saying good for you, you made an effort, that takes work or maybe it's singing to the armies of Mordor that just immediately gave up when Aragorn showed up? I don't know, it's really hard to read, this one. Also, there's the best song in the whole movie. Well, there's a whip, there's a 
win. All the Goblin songs, total jams. I don't care that the song is totally inappropriate for this movie, this universe, this everything. I love this song. I love these orcs. Look at this Muppety Orc captain with his wide mouth and a neck that looks like the perfect fit for Carol Spinney's arm. I love it all. And even though this scene makes me want to apologize to Disney's Robin Hood and take back everything I said about its reused animation, it is the best scene in the whole movie. Because it does three very interesting things that aren't in the book. First off, it humanizes the orcs way more than Tolkien ever did. We don't wanna go to war today, but the Lord of the Lashes has Yep, big mood. Second, it gives Sam even more agency as he actually fuels the fight that allows him and Frodo to escape. And you call yourself an orc? You're right! Right! Kill him! And third, it changes the battalion that they squabble with from other orcs to a battalion of men, which ties it thematically with the notion that the world of man is taking over, a theme that is pervasive in the book, and it's the theme that the movie really seems to double down on, even though I'm not entirely sure how it feels about that theme. Consider no less than the cataclysmic transformation of that ancient world of wonder and magic to the world we know now of man. Especially at the end. Sure, they skip the scouring, but since they never show the return to the Shire, they don't outright deny that it was corrupted, so small victories. Bilbo announces that he's leaving Middle-earth tomorrow with Gandalf and Elrond, and Frodo decides he wants to come. But I thought only elves departed thus. How can Bilbo join you? Bilbo has served us well. There is always room for a friend. Have I served thee well? Need you ask such a question? I have grown weary of this world. The weight of the ring all these years has worn me far beyond my age. I would, if it pleases you, set sail with you on the morrow. This isn't exactly decided on a whim, mind you, since he had the thought of doing such a thing earlier in his adventure, but that was a passing fancy that he didn't exactly give much deliberation to. And only elves can escape Middle-earth. They board the white ships at the Grey Havens and sail off, off to the lands beyond. Roads go ever, ever on. He didn't even really think it would be possible for him to leave earlier. He was just like, huh, that's a nice fantasy. Now he's just ready to go because he's weary and it's the age of man. Will there be no room for hobbits in this new age of man? For us all, hobbits are the closest to men. One day they will be as men are. Frodo is a bit larger than Bilbo, just as you are larger than Frodo. And younger still than you and larger are Merry and Pippin. Nothing to do with Entraft, you're just naturally big. It'll be those humans who might well wonder, is there hobbit in me? Is there? Okay, so it's no, well, I'm back, but the idea of the hobbits assimilating into humankind is an interesting note to end the movie on. I mean, it's definitely meant to pander to the child watching at home. You could be a hobbit too. Anyone can wear the fuzzy feet into the hobbit verse. But considering Tolkien's notion that the hobbits are just really rare now and avoid the big folk, the idea that the descendants of hobbits are among us is interesting. In this moment, it's definitely played as a hopeful, inspiring note, but you could also read it as humanity just kind of taking over Hobbit kind and erasing its culture, the gentrification of the Shire. I don't know. And then the very last notion of the movie is a reprise of the notion about not bothering to start. If you never say hello, you won't have to say goodbye. What is this movie trying to say? That Sam would be happier if he just never met Frodo in the first place? Like I said, this movie is interesting. And like I said, I don't think this is better than the other two movies, but by being less beholden to the literal text of the book, I find myself spending less time just comparing individual moments to the source material, and more time appreciating the strange but charming mess it is on its own, and scratching my head as I try to analyze the brand new additions it makes to the story. I don't know what all this is going for, but it's definitely going for something, and I have a weird respect for the attempt. 
And those are the animated Tolkien movies. A TV special, its sequel, and another completely unfinished movie in the middle. And the maker of that movie in the middle was furious about the other two, because he feared his work would be associated with them. And that's exactly what happened. I'm sorry, Ralph. It's a chaotic non-trilogy with a middle entry made by a sincere, if controversial, artist, bookended by entries made by more mainstream filmmakers known for their commercial crowd-pleasers, the finale of which barely even tries to follow up on the middle entry. And before you rush to the comments with your very clever and original crack about the Star Wars sequel trilogy, just remember that for decades, this was really all we had. For better or for worse, this non-trilogy was THE Lord of the Rings movie trilogy. So why did so many of us grow up thinking this was a trilogy? Simple. Because Warner Brothers acquired all the studios that made the films and started selling them together. VHS and DVD 3 packs of the films led people to assume that they were always meant to go together, even though actually watching them should have cleared up that misconception. Warner Brothers took these Tolkien adaptations and disregarded their actual contents, they didn't really think about how they fit together as a story, they just knew that it was something they wanted to sell to cash in on people's love for this world. Fortunately, that would never happen again! The most recent DVD release of this non-trilogy really steers into making you think it is a trilogy. Look at this consistent package design, all referring to these as the original animated classics. Of course, when you put the DVDs in, you realize that's all packaging. The Bakshi movie has a DVD menu that indicates that this is a movie they put on DVD on purpose, while the Rankin Bass DVDs are so hastily thrown together using whatever default templates Warner Home Video was using at the time. The Hobbit DVD is even missing a bunch of sound effects for inexplicable reasons, which now haven't been heard since the last VHS release. <laughs> Oh, stop complaining! Oh, stop complaining! I never promised to burgle your first class accommodation! I cannot believe this DVD is showing such utter disrespect to Tom Clack. The Bakshi DVD doesn't have much in the way of bonus features, but it does have a documentary featurette, which is quite welcome. The Rankin Bass movies just have still slides of Tolkien facts and that bullcrap cast and crew thing DVDs used to do, except on both The Hobbit and The Return of the King DVD, they just list The Hobbit's cast. A-plus work, gang! Each Rankin Bass DVD also has From the Vault, which is just whatever loosely medieval-themed cartoons from the Warner Library they felt like including. A couple of Looney Tunes, a Droopy, a Tom and Jerry. They're all fine cartoons, but they're not really a selling point. But now I really wish Warner Brothers had just done like a Carrot Blanca style Tolkien Looney Tunes cartoon so that that could be included. In a hole in the ground, there lived a wabbit. Well, despite my many misgivings, I still really enjoy revisiting this incoherent accidental trilogy from time to time. In fact, I probably revisit it more often than the Jackson movies, if only because it takes me less time to watch the cartoons, and I know many Tolkien fans have re-examined the first two movies in the wake of their Peter Jackson counterparts. And while some fans of the books are divided as to whether Jackson or Bakshi got more of Lord of the Rings right, generally speaking, more fans prefer the simplicity of the Rankin-Bass Hobbit to the overwrought Jackson version. Personally, neither of them are my favorite Hobbit adaptation, but we'll talk about that next week. In the meantime, what are your thoughts on the cartoons? Love them? Hate them? Like some parts of some of them? Let's discuss this all in the comments, and until next week, this is Dave, signing off.